happy Pride Month. Hey, yes. <laughs> As listeners may know, not only is it Gemini season, not only it is Pride Month, it is also my birthday week. So, like, stars wow. have aligned. Yeah, I was going to say, this is a confluence of the cosmic natures of things. I am all powerful <laughs> for a month. <laughs> I wanted to bring it up, though, because we got a listener email from Orla. Mm hmm It's pronouns are it, it's. Okay. It asks, even though it's only a few days into Pride Month, I've always seen brands utilizing queerness to sell their goods, and it really annoys me. Would you be interested in talking about how we got to accepting queer people as a society because we can use them to sell things? That's, uh, I mean, they've, they've, they're down to, like, Raytheon has, like, a rainbow <laughs> pattern in there is, like the more female drone pilots or whatever you know that whole mm -hmm. <laughs> it's yeah. messed up man even the defense industry yeah i mean it really nailed it on the head right there it is it is literally just the commodification of a people realizing oh a lot of these people not all of them by any means but a lot of them are affluent and they will spend their dollars so yes there we go yeah and i think that that ties into the inclusion of more and more people uh, the kind of breaking down of racial barriers, for example, and things mm -hmm. like that, or or advancing gender equality to a degree, as capitalism kind of realizes, oh, we can we have a market here that we could take advantage of. Yeah, let's bring these people into the fold of what only the straight white people are partaking in right now. Yeah, it's interesting to me to see what the limits of those acceptance like criteria are. Mm-hmm. It's extremely easy to accept gay marriage now because it's like, well, you're just like the rest of us. You just, you get married and you buy things and that's but, cool. Yeah. <laughs> Other than that, you're basically, you're, you are a family, a nuclear family in the same way. You just have different basic components of it. <laughs> yeah. And like, even like the racial component or like the trans community, there are limits to how much they accept it. As soon as you get into like providing trans people health care, like that ain't mm -hmm. going to fly or, you yeah. know taking a look at how we exploit people in other countries. That's not going to fly. Yeah. Or reparations mm -hmm. or giving back land that was stolen. Yeah. As soon as there's a material cost, they're like, no, mm -hmm. we'll, we'll put a flag up because that's fucking easy. <laughs> right. We wanted to put you in our ads so we could sell things. Yeah. Uh, yeah. That's it. Like they're, they're not going to do anything. They're just going to say they support you, which is insane. <laughs> yes, for sure. I mean, yeah, yeah it's better than like, getting called slurs or whatever obviously sure. but like it's not a real material impact just as pretty much everything that capitalism does it seems that and cap we're talking in these big terms but corporate <laughs> firms right individual firms making these decisions just about everything that they uh do is not uh, that sounds sort of progressive mm -hmm. Is the bare fucking minimum that they could do? You know, it's <laughs> it really like is. this. We we tested like this is as as far out as we have to go to like get credit for being good, get a little bit of market share or whatever, and that's it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it absolutely is. Yeah, it's just fucked up, man. Like I don't know. Everyone was like so excited telling me with like the Dallas skyline being all gay and shit. I'm like, I mean, it's cool, but like, let me see those financial records and see who they donated to. <laughs> You know, like, <laughs> I bet I won't like that. <laughs> uh, yeah. Well, you know, you might. You might at the local level, maybe. Uh, it's a democratic city, but mm. you probably won't at the uh, statewide level, at least. No, no, I will not. <laughs> <laughs> well, that was a cheerful start, but <laughs> do you want to get to our, our real topic today? Is anyone still tuning in for a cheerful, uh, for yeah, cheerful right. content here? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, we've had complaints. I make too many jokes, so... <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. We're just bringing it down to a nice sobering talk. Mm -hmm. Here we are on NPR discussing... Yes, let me get my glasses. Length, whatever. Oof. Get my librarian look going. No humor. I might mark off points for that because in this episode, <laughs> you're going to be doing a report. You're going to be teaching me, basically. Let's not call it a report, honestly. We're switching roles. Yes. You're teaching me. No, every time someone complains that I'm like loud or make too many jokes, I'm just going to get louder and make more jokes, so... <laughs> review at your own caution. I just get more powerful. 
But then someone who was actually of the contrary opinion, right? They thought mm. you could actually increase your volume. You could actually like make more jokes. They're going to now go on and review and say, uh, <laughs> oh uh, no, too cool, you know, too loud, too many jokes. Uh, just so you'll do it. No, don't, don't, ne don't neg me if you don't actually dislike <laughs> me. Please don't. I'm very sensitive. Okay. Today, we're going to be talking about the Federal Art Project. All right. Yeah. I think I like this. Uh, I think you will. Definition of it, basically. So Federal Art Project was underneath the Works Projects Administration or Works Progress Administration. They apparently changed their name. Yeah. they. Uh, it's one of those. It's before everything was like actually an acronym that was a word, you know, as oh, far as yeah. laws go. But this, you're talking about the New Deal era. Yes. Yes. I think they just did it because they're like, well, we already have our stationery and everything is like stamped with WPA. I'm not going to change it. <laughs> yeah. Oh, so they renamed it apparently in 1939. Yeah. Well, did it go from progress to projects? Uh, yes. Yeah. Uh, progress to projects. Yeah. I think that may, may have sounded more concrete to Republicans or something. It's mm. just shovel ready stuff. You yeah. Yeah. <laughs> All right. So yeah, we're going to be talking about that and specifically how it relates to the left and the labor movement. And yeah. Cool. Let's get into it. I always like to start art historical things by going like a little bit further back so we get some context. All right. So let's talk about art from the 1920s. Can I tell you what I know? What do you or know? Or what I think I know? What do you think you know? To me, when I think of art in the 20s, I think of like the... Well, obviously jazz is the jazz age. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And I think of like the very, the highly stylized like pictures of like flappers and people Ooh, in yeah. very fancy uh, tuxedos and Ooh, the, monocles and stuff. What are they? The arrow shirt guys? Yeah. Yeah. Those hotties. <laughs> so that's what I think of in the 20s. The guy who's like super famous was for that, JC Landecker, I think, was like hella gay and just like got to draw hot guys for a living. So like live in the dream. Damn, yeah, that's <laughs> do what you love, and you'll still be exploited by capitalism, but at least it won't be so bad. Oh my gosh, that's going to be shirt number three. <laughs> <laughs> In like a really cheesy, like mom Hobby Lobby sign font. Mm, yes. <laughs> yeah, live, laugh, love. Ugh, I got to get on these shirts, guys. <laughs> but you're right. So commercial side, it's very pleasant. You know, I would also throw in like maybe Norman Rockwell. That's kind of when he got his start. Oh, so okay. very like just commercialism buy this shit look how good america is right there's that famous photo where there's like this really idyllic billboard like america the land of opportunity and then there's mm -hmm. a bread line in front of it have you seen that yeah one? yeah yeah so that's what we're working with here just like the happy images yeah yeah everything's good the other side of that, so more of like the quote unquote fine art side of that, um, you have what was called surrealism. What do you know about that? To me, that is Salvador Dali. Exactly. And weird kind of, well, it's surreal. I don't know. <laughs> That's <laughs> perfect. Not a great description, but. <laughs> no, I mean, I was basically going to say the same thing. Like he is the quintessential artist at that period. There's many more, but he's a very easy reference because like, yeah, he painted the weird melting clock picture, if you've seen that. Yeah. Very mysterious and cerebral and like trying to be like otherworldly or whatever. Okay. So those are like the two art styles you have kind of going in. There's obviously more than that. We're simplifying. Okay. So when the economy crashes, we all are like, I don't think we have time for like fun surrealist dream exploration anymore we're all dying <laughs> so there's a real rejection of those like kind of what's seen as like european ideas of surrealism and and that kind of art and a big turn towards realism mm -hmm. and that kind of goes in two different stripes as well all right so first you have what's called regionalism this is another made up art term. <laughs> Literally Time Magazine <laughs> did an interview with one guy and was like, he's a regionalist, like just made up the term. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Made it easier to explain basically to their readers. Yeah. Yeah. So Grant Wood would be a famous one of these, um, you know, American Gothic, the, the guy with the pitchfork and the lady. Oh, okay. Yes. Yeah. Yes. The farmer picture. <laughs> yes. Farmer picture. It's what it should have been called. Uh, so that's like a very classic example. You also have artists like Thomas Hart Benton, John Stuart Curry, Martin Hartley, but they were all really focused on depicting 
the American heartland or just like, quote unquote, the real America, whatever that means. Mm -hmm. So like Americana. <laughs> Very Americana. That's how we would kind of call it, right? Like mm -hmm. the American, not the American dream, but yeah, classic America. Yeah, I wasn't necessarily idealized. Um, Grant Wood in particular was like a little bit satirical. Mm -hmm. So the other side of that, you have what's called social realism. Ooh. Okay. So this has actually, yeah, it has kind of a longer history than this regionalism stuff. It actually kind of originated in Europe in, I don't know the dates. Uh, Courbet is a very famous one, but they are all about depicting social issues such as like poverty and immigration through art. And it's mm, okay. all about showing like the tension between like the powerful and the oppressed and just like really showing poor people like in a sympathetic lens for the most part. All right. I, I dig that. This is different <laughs> than, this is different than socialist realism. You guessed my next bullet point. Oh, okay. All right. <laughs> so that was Stalin's thing. Okay. That is super idealized and realistic and just, you know, basically propaganda. Like here's a it's hot like guy. Socialism. It's cool. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> here's a hot guy with a torch. Do socialism. Yes. Okay. All right. Not a bad selling point, but you know, <laughs> so socialist realism that sometimes shows up in social realism. Like sometimes they'll be a little bit idealized. Like there's a lot of, we'll see later. There's a lot of like very masculine figures doing like tough work, like mining and shit. Okay. Yeah. That's part of my impression of the WPA art, uh, from what I know in history. <laughs> yeah. There's definitely like some of that flavor in there, but it's, mm -hmm. that's not like all it it's is. It's a different thing. Yeah. yeah. And you're saying social realism is highlight the social problems in society mm -hmm. more like question. Does it, prov it's, it's not so much like, here's what we should do. Yeah. It's more like showing the inequality. I would say awareness like, okay. New deal time. Heck. Yeah, sort of. Like, I used to be, uh, <laughs> I'll insert myself here a little bit. I used to be way more like, hell yeah, dude, we just need to like do the New Deal again. Like, you know, right? Just fucking give people jobs, you know, have the government solve problems. But I mean, from a more left perspective, the New Deal is more like kind of, again, doing the bare minimum. Yes. To prop everything up again. <laughs> but yeah. I mean, it's still good in its in its way like it's an improvement maybe yeah i mean don't get me wrong i'd be fucking psyched if it happened again mm -hmm. but yeah we should also be doing more like yes and <laughs> <laughs> yeah yeah good point um i was gonna say you want to give us a little little eighth grade you know textbook definition of new deal you don't have to make it eighth grade in like you know a texas textbook maybe <laughs> don't do that <laughs> So the New Deal, this is kind of the flagship program of Franklin Delano Roosevelt's administration. Mm -hmm. His recovery plan for getting America out of the Great Depression. Uh, it was kind of a, a bunch of things, you know, financial reform, like this program here, public works, not just in art, but in infrastructure, really pumping up the government in terms of making it an energetic, uh, actually taking a role in the economy uh, before this it's strange for us to imagine now but before this the government was super small tiny mm -hmm. uh, in terms of its agency's power and everything so this really transformed thing you're talking between uh 1933 to 1939 and there's actually two phases like the first yeah. new deal and the second new deal the first new deal happening from 1933 1934 kind of the initial mm -hmm. get up and go and then the second New Deal from 1935 to 1936. Yes. We have kind of lo a little longer lasting stuff like Social Security, oh. Labor Relations Board, that sort of thing. Cool. In my research, I thought it was really interesting because I watched like a newsreel from the time. Yeah. And the language they use is so weird. They're like, people want to work and like give mm -hmm. them the dignity of hard work. And it was just so Puritan. <laughs> <laughs> that was a huge part of the of why you had like work, uh, why you had to come up with like projects to do to make sure that people like got, you know, like what I have to say, shovel ready projects is got some tools and like went to do a thing mm -hmm. or whatever, because like the government was very scared of just giving people money. Yeah. 
They thought that would be bad for their morale. They obviously probably also thought that would be bad for their <laughs> profits later on, you know. Yeah. So part of the New Deal was the Works Progress slash Projects Administration, right? Mm hmm So this was really just trying to create employment, like you said, you know, big, huge projects like infrastructure. The Tennessee Valley Authority is part of that, like just a huge ass project. Yeah, yeah. And that one actually still around. Wait, the WPA is? No, uh, the Tennessee Valley. Oh, Board. yeah, 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 it is. Part of this was something called Federal Project Number One, which is a cool name. Yeah, uh, that's sounds like we're going to space. Exactly. It sounds like some spy <laughs> shit, and I'm into it. <laughs> but actually, this was basically the arts section. Okay, that's interesting that it's first. <laughs> I know. Number one priority. I'm into it. <laughs> they spent around $27 million and employed up to 40,000 artists in various fields. And this was actually divided into five like sub projects, which I kind of wanted to go through quickly because they're really interesting. Okay. Yeah. So first we have the federal writers project. Okay. Some famous beneficiaries from this were John Steinbeck and Zora Neale Hurston. Hmm. Okay. And I was reading about it. There's this like Jacobin article about it. it. Apparently the project had kind of some hiccups because what they would do, they had all these writers out of work and it was everything from like big name writers to mm -hmm. people who would like write instruction manuals and like ad copy and stuff like that. Okay. Yeah. So different skill levels or something. Not skill. I don't know. Well known. <laughs> yeah. I have some of that too, though. Like. It was very hard to find work that was appropriate for people because like your little writers maybe weren't as used to some of these projects. And then the big ones had such big egos. It was like, oh my God, will you just fucking write the copy? Like, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So they would set them on things like write a like state guide for this state, you know, like write the fucking Mississippi tour guide or whatever. <laughs> oh, okay. Yeah. So yeah, I thought that was a really interesting project. Another one was the historical records survey. Part of this was actually the interviewing of former slaves in the South. So, like, that's a huge historical oh, resource. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Oral history. Mm -hmm. There were also archaeological studies. So, studying like pre Columbian indigenous cultures, you know, doing digs and preservation and stuff like that. Cool. And this last bit was technically under a few different programs. Like, there was an agricultural program, something like that. Mm -hmm. But they had a photography division. And they would go out and basically document the Great Depression and yeah. like the great migration of farmers. A lot of the very famous photos from that time were taken by these people like Dorothea Lange, you know, the very famous migrant photo mother. The woman, mm -hmm, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. That's what I was actually going to ask. Is that, is that from there? <laughs> that's totally her. All right. Next, we have the Federal Theater Project. Okay. So this included 225,000 performances and then some. They just sent, did they send people out or were they like funding, you know, local community theater style things? I believe it was both. Okay. A lot of touring though, from what I understand. Cool. Some of the notable productions that I thought were interesting, there was an all black production of Macbeth and it was like set in Haiti. Oh, cool. Yeah. <laughs> and this play called The Revolt of the Beavers, I'm going to send you a link to all right. the poster for it. Hold on. This is not in our slideshow, but uh, you could just Google Revolt of the Beavers poster. It's quite a treat for the eyes. That's fucking dope. <laughs> <laughs> Meet the chief. Meet the chief. So this is a fucking labor metaphor in a children's play. Oh, nice. Like the chief, I guess, is an asshole to the rest of the beavers. Yeah. The chief forces everyone to work and hoards all the goods. And one of the beavers named like Oak Leaf or something this is some fucking red wall shit leads a dang socialist revolution where they all share. Oh, heck yeah. <laughs> That's awesome. Critics called it Marxism a la mother goose. They're not wrong, but it sounds amazing. But it's cool. Yeah. Yeah. That's a good thing. <laughs> that's what we were going for was the response. <laughs> Thank you. Next, we have the federal music project concerts going on tour and all of these programs had some kind of, I would say ideals that they stuck to one of mm -hmm. which was really bringing arts 
to everybody. So making it more accessible. So like some of these people had never seen live theater before or a concert before, like these more rural areas. So there was a lot of touring going on. And they also really proposed or like a strong proponent of learning by doing. So a lot of mm -hmm. these included an educational component. Okay. All right. That's cool. Yeah. It's like participatory. It's like education, but like, I don't know. It's just interesting that we once tried. <laughs> Can you imagine? I don't know. <laughs> Can you imagine a modern day? No. <laughs> how fast that would get shot down or like not even proposed in the first place. No. And that was something that was really interesting in this research. There was this whole swath of articles that came out like around a few months into the pandemic where everyone's like, we need to do this again. And it was just really interesting to hear them like there's a, a craving for it, but it's like the environment is so different. Like that just sh shit wouldn't get off the ground. <laughs> yeah. That would be laughed out of the halls of Congress. Like it absolutely would. Yeah. This brings us to the last of these five programs, the federal art project. All right. First off, terrible logo. <laughs> Do you like it? I'm, I mean, it's, mm, it's got, you know, it's got some parts. It's got the little <laughs> easel. No, that's a palette. That's what I mean, a palette. I knew what it was. I said the wrong thing because I'm dumb. Uh, <laughs> yeah, the palette. What's it? That's not great. It looks like a, I don't know. It doesn't look good. It gives me Nazi vibes, but I think that's just the fact that it's from the 40s. And it's yeah, an eagle. Yeah, everything has those eagle <laughs> clean line sort of things. Yeah. I think the NRA has like a straight up like spread wing eagle thing. The National Recovery Administration. Yeah, they came up in my research, and when I heard that acronym, I was like, wait, what? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Different NRA, guys. Yes. But, okay, yeah, not the best logo. Weird logo. Terrible acronym, I'll tell you that. I kept typing that out and had to backspace. <laughs> <laughs> what? I mean, they're just helping the country <laughs> with FAP. <laughs> That's how you get a nation back on their feet. Morale. <laughs> That's how you boost morale. Yep. Do something. <laughs> anyway, this covered both public art and what you would consider more traditionally fine art. Okay. All in all, they employed around 10,000 artists and created over 200,000 individual works of art. Interesting. I got a question, I guess, that I'll mm -hmm. interject. So when, when you have done kind of the research on this, is 10,000, that sounds very small. Um, my point here is, do you think that the programs overall had do you think that, that 10,000 was very you know small economically too or do you think that maybe it had like a wider effect in terms of like people getting to see this art and stuff I think it has a wider effect because just the art production was just part of the project mm -hmm. they also did instruction and research so it was like a much wider effect and also like so we can talk about the program now it, in in the easel program, so like if you're like a painter or whatever, yeah, you get paid $25 a week to bring in one painting a month. And that's like a really good rate for the time. <laughs> working at the uh, working at the art factory, basically. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, you had to produce consistently or you'd get kicked out. Like if you were late lots of times, you'd be like, no, sorry. No. Yeah, okay. You couldn't produce nudes or quote unquote explicitly political art. Obviously, Ooh. we're going to see people towed that line, made that line mm, okay. blurry, really fucked around with that. Good. <laughs> um, <laughs> we're going to be focusing more on like the left side of that, clearly. Let me be clear. There was a lot of not political art in here, too, but I found more leftist art than I was expecting. Awesome. All right. Cool. But yeah, to answer your question, though, I, I think, yeah, maybe the numbers themselves seem small, but for me, the fact that artists were even in the mix is really important yeah okay and that kind of gets to what i want to talk about like how this was created mm -hmm. so there's if you just like google this <laughs> the very common narrative you'll find is that george biddle a painter who like went to harvard with fdr wrote him a uh. letter and was like hey mexico's doing all these murals we should do that we should have a public arts program let's do it Blah, blah, blah. Right. Kind of a hey, old chum sort of thing. Yes. Right. And it's it's shown as this very, like, paternalistic, like, let's hand you poor artists a job. Mm-hmm. Yes. Let's do something for the struggling bums. Yes. 
When in reality, there was like a mass movement behind this. There was a lot of agitation for this. Uh, I like that. <laughs> you had the Communist Party USA. You had the Artist Union. They formed something called the Unemployed Artist Group. And something called John Reed Clubs were basically just like little communist clubs all around. So John Reed Clubs. Those yeah. are named after John or Jack Reed, as he was known at the time. Like a socialist, uh, kind of, well, kind of communist uh journalist slash activist okay uh he famously went to went to russia and documented the october revolution whoa okay. firsthand he was like there and wrote this book called 10 days that shook the world mm, okay okay yeah i didn't look into who that was but yeah there was a mass like agitation for this it wasn't just like oh please like give us this it was like fucking give us this <laughs> yeah awesome <laughs> and they also had to continue to fight as like immediately the program started facing cuts like you just immediately had republicans tearing their fucking clothes off being like this is ridiculous all so. these yeah <laughs> all these not hippies but you know yeah bohemian types mm -hmm. who shouldn't be financing them yeah yeah same thing as they would do to prevent it from happening today absolutely yes <laughs> i just think that's really interesting that's classic america you know the great man story of like this mm -hmm. one guy came up with an idea so we did it like <laughs> yeah he came yeah Came up with the right idea, West Wing style. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And everyone bought in because it was correct. Yes. <laughs> but it's like, no, people are fucking pissed. Yeah. Instead, they were forced to by the masses. Yeah. And like, you that's know? honestly how I think we've talked about this before. The rest of the New Deal was also very much that too. Like you had, what are they called? Hoovervilles, like just slum mm -hmm. cities. And yeah. people would fucking mobilize. You had a small but growing communist party. Mm -hmm. You had, you know, the socialist party. Obviously, you had, you had this like budding left current that i mean people were also taking to the streets and we're not just talking about like the liberal bastions now because that wasn't a thing back then like we're talking the middle of the country you were yeah. like worried about an agrarian revolution in kansas yeah because you know? i mean you had these huge swaths of people abandoning farms flocking to the cities and being like i need a fucking job <laughs> right yeah like you said we've talked about it before but putting pressure popular pressure mass pressure mm -hmm. on the government to not please pass this legislation but we're gonna do something for ourselves <laughs> we'll leave the you know the ball is in your court if you want to try to save the system you've got because we're gonna do something else otherwise yes yes <laughs> another thing this program did was establish community art centers in like underserved neighborhoods as well so they established the harlem community art center which was like a really big deal for the harlem renaissance a lot of famous people mm. from that movement were yeah either teaching there or trained there stuff like that cool they also offered tons of art classes for both adults and kids just like there's all these posters like come learn lithography or like photography or like all oh. these like really wide variety of disciplines Right, because that would be another way to employ an artist is, is teaching mm -hmm. someone. That's cool. And this is also why we have art taught in public schools today, although that is increasingly vanishing. Uh, it started oh. with this. Are they really just... I haven't seen that in my district, my area, but are they... Is that like a nationwide thing now? I mean, I don't know if they're just like straight up cutting it, but like it's just... There's not a lot of funding for it, that's for sure. Mm, yeah. yeah. Okay. okay, so let's get into some of the specific projects and and pieces so this is our our first piece in the slideshow if you're following us on social media we will post these we'll be looking All at right. 10 images today and like i said we're going to be focusing on the left side of things so like yeah there was a lot of just like i, I painted a park and it's cool <laughs> <You know>? so <laughs> hey yeah. guys check out my park <laughs> check it out the first project we'll be looking at is the poster division this is probably one of the more famous series series yes of posters and art items produced by this project we've got the yellowstone national park poster right here what do you think i love it i guess this is old faithful maybe I is think that so. in yellowstone i right. don't know i'm not a <laughs> nature, nature kids person over here <laughs> nature check this here i love this series of posters i actually use it with my students and get them to like do a style like this style of poster, mm. like a adver poster advertisement sort of thing, like go do the thing, you know, but for <laughs> different historical. I kind of use that a few times in the year, like, hey, we're going to do this on oh, fun. whatever subject, you know. That's cool. And yeah, I get to show them cool New Deal art. So Hell yeah. <laughs> so yeah, the poster division is probably one of the more famous 
areas in this program. They did over 35,000 poster designs. Oh, wow. And created around 2 million silkscreen posters. The crazy thing about that is most of them are lost. Like, they're very hard to find. Huh. Yeah, I was going to say, I <laughs> definitely haven't seen that much variety in them. I've seen, you know, several. But <laughs> Well, what's interesting is because there are posters, people just like throw them away, paint over them, post over them, whatever. Like, they weren't yeah. treated with care, obviously. It was mass produced. Yeah, and even this National Park series, if you look up some of them, they'll have these like boxes in the layout. And that was so the individual campsites could post like, here's our activities this week. Oh, okay. Yeah. They did it for utility and also so people wouldn't steal them. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So yeah, it's, it's like a big project trying to find and also restore all these posters. Like this one guy, I watched some videos of him. He, his mm -hmm. whole job is like trying to find, track down these posters and then work with artists to like recreate the color because like we only have like photo negatives. So it's just really interesting. Oh, wow. Yeah. Uh, question mm -hmm. about just, I guess, technology in the times. Like were these all like produced one by one? This was, you couldn't just Xerox this shit, right? Yeah. So this is a silk screen printing method, which I don't know a ton about. You basically have screens and you like I think you just put ink on it and <laughs> I don't know, guys, I was not a printmaker uh, major, <laughs> but yeah, it, I mean, it was a faster process than other things, but yeah, it wasn't just like super easy. You, okay. you had to have someone who knew what they were doing. Right. Okay. So it's a, a skilled reproduction of it, I guess. I would say yes. Cool. These posters covered everything from education, arts, public health, travel, the national parks and we're basically mm -hmm. just like propaganda which is fine most things are <laughs> well like public service announcements right i've seen yeah. some of them they're like there was this really good one it was like an eye chart or something and it's like johnny might not be yeah. dull he just might need his eyes checked like get an eye exam you know for sure yeah there's stuff like hey here's stuff about stds you might not know <laughs> ah yeah they also covered things like the theater projects we were talking about. Um, that was a huge component is making posters to show mm. that stuff or like the art classes to advertise those. So it kind yeah. of all supported itself. This is like what graphic design and everything. That's, that's, that's what you guys will be doing <laughs> in the commune, you know? <laughs> that's great because if I could tell you how many times I've heard a pitch for, let's do this, but in the style of WPA posters. <laughs> <laughs> oh, <laughs> it's a I mean, it's a good idea for a reason. These are beautiful and like mm -hmm. it has roots kind of in that like Russian constructivism and Bauhaus design where it's like very legible, very easy to understand. Yeah, so it's like, just overdone. Yeah, it's a little overdone, or, but it's fine. Like too easy of an idea. <laughs> but it'd be cool to have those projects, but like do it in a completely different style. Like that'd be awesome. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, I'd be down for that job for sure. <laughs> um they also worked with something called the civilian conservation corps do you know about that so yeah the the ccc the civilian conservation corps uh these guys were it was like a it was a relief program a works relief program from the mid 1933 kind of the start of the new deal i think this ran through in the beginning of world war ii even mm -hmm. and it was for young men yeah uh, so they would kind of send teams of these guys to go like you said build national parks but like things you know for people to like do in national parks like yeah cabins for people or like visitor centers mm. all the things that kind of you know make a national park kind of usable for modern people i guess yeah yeah uh or like you know cut trails and mm, uh, yeah set up like guideposts and things along the way it was it was a uh like a constructive you know, build things, summer camp sort of thing for these young men. It wasn't just like boys. <laughs> just uh, teens? Like teens. No, it was like 17 to 28. Okay, okay. It was the, was the age range, so. Cool. I mean, that sounds awesome. Yeah, it was a lot of people. Maximum enrollment at any one time was 300,000. Damn. And overall, about 3 million young men participated in it. Damn. So that's the poster division, I think. A pretty straightforward example of what this program could be like this is definitely on the more utility side yeah all right the next image we're gonna look at what do you think this guy is Ooh, looks like a quilt yeah what would you say the medium of this art piece is the medium i don't know 
thread, but like cotton. I don't know. Okay. Okay. So I'm, I'm going to ask you. So this is a photograph of a quilt. Uh huh. It's not a photograph of a quilt. That's a fucking watercolor drawing. Holy shit. Right. <laughs> what? <laughs> so someone drew this. Someone fucking drew that. That's cool. I thought that that was, I was just straight up looking at a quilt that someone had quilted or, yeah, or yeah. you know, created. <laughs> so this is part of the Index of American Design. This project is crazy to me for many reasons. <laughs> so uh. you can find a category like listing of all the objects covered in this. Mm -hmm. You can go to nga.gov and then just kind of search around for it. I found it in my Googles, so you can get to it. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, that's really cool because you can see all the different types of objects they painted. But basically, this project was trying to record like folk and decorative arts from early colonial times to 1900. Dude, that's awesome. Yeah, and to do this, they made 18,000 watercolor drawings. Wow. You might be like, why the fuck would you do that? Why don't you just take a goddamn picture and move on? <laughs> mm -hmm. This was the 1930s. Photography was not that good yet. They could not get color, for instance. <laughs> Ah, so this would be one of the few ways to kind of record that. Yeah, and they felt that watercolor could better capture, like, the texture and, like, there's a lot of textile work covered in this, mm -hmm. like the one we're looking at here. And it's so cool, though. Like, I spent a long time in this gallery just looking because they covered everything from, like, children's toys to, like, women's hats and costumes to furniture design. It was so cool. I'm sure that for a lot of that, that's the only record we have of what that stuff looked like, you know? Absolutely. Like, do you want to see a child's Noah's Ark playset from the fucking 1800s? <laughs> Absolutely, I do. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that's so cool. And you are exactly right that that kind of stuff is often the stuff that does not get preserved. Mm-hmm. Folk art and decorative arts are often seen as lesser art or just, yeah. just less likely to be... I don't know, revered in that way. It's, yeah, it's just drivel from the commoners, you know? Mm -hmm, yeah, and honestly, a lot of it is domestic work, which means women's work. So we're going to devalue it, you know, it's just like yeah. it is. <laughs> it's frivolous. Yeah, right. Just just pretty sewing. Like, Jesus, if I could <laughs> sew like this, that's insane. Yeah, for real. Yeah. So this was intended to serve, you know, a few purposes. One was preserving that kind of art almost like an archaeological project just really documenting it yeah and then it was also to kind of create um a reference material um basically just so you have this historical like more long-term view of american design because i think america always has a complex of like europe has all this history and stuff and we don't and so <laughs> mm, yeah so this was really trying to maybe influence modern design by saying like here's all this like visual history we have here are like your artistic roots like yes yeah. in america yeah it reminds me of our kind of conversation about what kind of historical roots can american leftists like mm -hmm. draw on and stuff it's like important to know that you have had this popular history that you know official you know the official view kind of tries to gloss over for sure yeah i think that's a very good comparison. Also, it employed a fuck ton of people. So, like, yeah, if you're making yeah. 18,000 highly detailed watercolor drawings, like, yeah. <laughs> you're busy. <laughs> yeah, you got work. <laughs> highly recommend checking out that archive. It's really fucking cool. Yeah, I will be. That that was, you got me there. I thought that was a photo <laughs> for sure. Yeah, right? Okay, moving on into some more decorative arts is our next piece by Florence Kawa. And this is called, I mean, it's a wall hanging. I don't know if that's what it's called, but that's what I mm -hmm. found. What do you think about this, this piece? I don't like it. You got both men and women mm -hmm. working in the factories. Hell yeah. Side by side. Doesn't look like it's, you know, oh, the men are lifting the heavy things. The women are, you know, making sure they're fed. You know, it's, it's like. They're doing the same thing. Yeah. Which appears to be rubbing gears just with hey, their I don't hands. know if what they're precisely doing. But I don't know what their safety standards. They're doing labor. <laughs> <laughs> this is a block print on fabric. And this actually was gifted to Eleanor Roosevelt, who was a big proponent oh, cool. of the WPA. Yeah. To me, this really shows 
the emphasis on like an American folk art style. Like the figures are very stylized. Mm -hmm. The use of textile is very common for folk art. And really the depiction of the workers is showing like, hey, yeah, like you said, like everyone's participating. Uh, we're all working towards a common goal and also kind of sanitizing a bit, which we'll see later. Like there's no, you know, sweat or dirt or anything. Like it's not a gross mm -hmm. factory. It's this nice, clean imagery. Yeah. It's a good place to go work. It's, you know, and it's positive. You can see it's on the, on the top and the bottom borders, mm -hmm. the kind of the, the industrial scene there that it's all you're a part of that or like you're yeah, almost the beating heart of it sort of thing. Yeah. Oh, I like that. Cause yeah. they're in the middle of it. Yeah. Which can kind of get to like cognitive machine shit, but like in a good way, like that's what a lot of this art kind of talks about. It's interesting. Do your part, sort of a collective mm -hmm. collectivist in that way, mm. but like, but good, I guess. <laughs> and it's, it's a little bit illusory because I mean, honestly, you know, you're convincing people to do this, but as if there's like some sort of social ownership happening and stuff, but it's still actually capitalism. Yeah. Yeah, that's true. And I don't know. I, I do think it's interesting, this glorification of work. Cause like mm -hmm. on one level, it's cool. Like, yeah, we should respect labor. But the second half of that is you should respect labor, but like properly compensating people and not exploiting them. And like a lot of this, like only addresses the first half, <laughs> like, like the pride conversation. Kind of. Yeah. Yeah. It says like, you know, it's right. You should respect work or the laborer even mm -hmm. that's as far as it goes. It doesn't say like, and that means they should be in control. Like, yeah. It doesn't get to that part. <laughs> right. But I mean, yes, not on them. I just mean for the broader project, like it's mm -hmm. not on the artist who, you know, no, this, this is so. dope. Yeah. But like the larger project is not trying to, <laughs> not trying to ask that question. <laughs> not really. But still cool. Yeah. So let's get to that good, straight communist juice. Uh, yes, please. All right. Image number four. We've got my man, problematic fave, Diego Rivera. <laughs> <laughs> uh, what does he, do you want to cover why he's problematic? Yeah, we'll get into some other reasons. But for me, he's problematic because my main girl is Frida and they had a very messy relationship. Mm, so okay. All right. I'm always going to be on Frida's side. I mean, they both cheated, but whatever. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Personal reasons. Yes, yes. But other reasons too, which we'll get into. Okay. <laughs> so what we're looking at here is the Detroit Industry Mural. This is the North Wall. There are three other walls. <laughs> okay. This was done in 1932. This is a, a fresco piece. So he took this contract from the Detroit Institute of Arts Garden Court, and this was sponsored by Edsel Ford, son of Henry Ford. So like... You know, with with like Ford money, actual, mm -hmm. you know. Mm -hmm. All right. Uh. <laughs> That's why it's kind of a problematic fave, too. Yeah. Uh, we talked about in our last episode, Ford's uh, support of, of, the, of the nationalists in Spain. And just <laughs> in general, like, I mean, Ford, it's, it's a titan of industry. Mm -hmm. And Henry Ford in particular, real asshole. Oh, yeah. Piece of shit. But I mean, you got to work, you know. No, you got to take some work. <laughs> and they, so Ford apparently needed to kind of fix their publicity because some workers went on a hunger strike to improve working conditions. So they're like, well, we'll sponsor this cool mural for the community. <laughs> oh, what? Uh, <laughs> totally normal <classic>. response. <laughs> yeah. Classic uh, deflection move. Right. But this is a cool mural. It's cool as fuck, right? Mm -hmm. Diego was openly communist, was in the communist party in Mexico eventually mm -hmm. got kicked out because he was like bfs with trotsky so yeah oh yeah that would be a problem for mainline mm -hmm. communists at the time yeah he gets his contract from ford he gets to tour the factory and is like really fascinated by the technology and you can kind of see in this mural he's really exploring the relationship between man and machine just like that earlier piece mm, yeah so a little bit of that, that cog in the machine sort of without the negative connotations maybe but like harmony between them. So a little bit of negative connotations, actually. So in other areas of the mural, I don't think it's in this particular panel, but you can look up the other panels as well. Mm -hmm. He will simultaneously on like one side of the wall, he'll show scientists working on a vaccine. And then on the other side, he'll show scientists working on a gas bomb. 
<laughs> so showing really the positives and negatives of this new technological society we're in. Yeah. He did the same thing with aviation, like, oh, cool, flying. Also warplanes. <laughs> mm -hmm. That's awesome. Yeah. So really exploring that relationship and like, is this a good thing? I don't know. Yeah. That's, I mean, it's, it's not inherent, right? It's not inherently a good or a bad thing. The system, whether you're, you know, whether it's popularly controlled or not, mm -hmm. that's kind of depends. That's, that's what decides of if you're going to make stuff to kill other rival capitalists, or if you're going to make stuff for the benefit of humanity. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. It's like, which path are you taking? Mm -hmm. Another reason he was a problematic fave, apparently his workers were pushed really hard. They worked like insane hours on this. Um, at one point, they protested for higher pay. I don't remember if it was this mural or another one, but at one point, one of his workers was like, hey, I'm going to go to the fucking papers and tell them you're not paying your workers well enough, and you're definitely going to lose some communist points for that, so, like, pay me. <laughs> <laughs> smart. Very so he smart he was move. a bad boss? He was a like, bad boss. <laughs> oh, what an asshole. I know, I know. It's so annoying. In one of the panels, again, it's not this one. I really liked this one, though, so that's why I picked it. But you can mm -hmm. just find the rest of them. Actually, the Google Arts, they have like a thing where you can kind of move around the mural. It's really cool. You can kind of scroll through the main panels. So you can oh, just okay. find it there. There's one panel that basically shows like a quasi nativity scene. And so you have like a little blonde baby with like his parents and like some animals at the bottom. And then you also have someone giving the baby a vaccine. <laughs> Okay. And the church was like, this is blasphemy. Apparently, they're very anti-vax. <laughs> what? <laughs> I don't think it was All because right. it was, it was they were anti-vax. I think it's just like, you can't show Jesus. The nativity scene. Yeah, you can't do a nativity scene and don't also do science. That, please. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Rivera's kind of hilarious, just like as a character. Mm -hmm. He painted this mural commissioned by the Rockefeller Center. So, those Rockefellers. Okay. Uh, it was called Man at the Crossroads, and in it, he included a portrait of, of Lennon. <laughs> oh, hell yeah. I think I've seen this one before. Yes, we have seen it because, spoiler for the rest of the story, it is now in Mexico City. Oh, okay, okay. Yeah, 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 yeah. it's downtown. So how is it in Mexico City, then, if the <laughs> yeah. Rockefellers wanted it? So they demanded he remove Lennon, or he would lose the commission, and they would destroy it, and he was just like, nah, fuck you. So they destroyed the mural. And he actually lost a commission for the upcoming Chicago World's Fair, which was kind of good because apparently he released a public statement saying, well, if they had hired me, I would just repaint that same mural over and over until I run out of money. <laughs> <laughs> petty. <laughs> Such a petty bitch. I love it. And he did That's end great. up repainting it in Mexico City. Dude. Yeah, I remember this. This is. It's a cool ass this mural. This is a great one. <laughs> So yeah, he's a fucking funny guy. I'll give him points for that. He's good at trolling the uh, the capitalists. <laughs> Definitely. Like, pay me and then I'll paint whatever I want and then just leave if I don't like it. <laughs> yeah, but unfortunately he absorbed a little bit of their, you know, mm -hmm. boss uh, tendencies. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Next, we have an image from the Coit Tower. This panel is from the library panel. All right. This particular section was by Bernard Zakim in 1933, but this was a very big project. So tons of artists worked on it. Both students and faculty from the California School of Fine Arts were like heavily involved. All right. Yeah. And the Coit Tower, that is in San Francisco. Yes, it is. All right. I want you to look at the guy in green in that green jumpsuit. Pretty good look. The guy that's posing? Yeah. Well, take a look at what he's reaching for. He's reaching for... A red book that looks like it might say Karl Marx. It absolutely does say Karl Marx. <laughs> oh, hell yeah. He's in for a good read. Right? He's going to have a good time. That is Das yeah. Capital. Oh, well, I don't know if he's in for a good read. I haven't read that. but Yeah, that one looks hard. <laughs> it's just it's got volumes and it's uh, lengthy. No, I don't have time for that. <laughs> and also one of the newspapers the guy is reading, Top... And like middle blonde guy. He has a mm -hmm. weird pinched up face. <laughs> yeah, he's like turned sideways like, oh, I can't believe what I'm reading. Yeah, so he is reading the headline about the destruction of Rivera's Man at the Crossroads mural. Oh, that's why he's so pissed. <laughs> yeah, he's like, what the fuck? In fact, a lot of the artists working on Coit Tower picketed when that mural was destroyed. Oh, 
Cool. Solidarity. Exactly. Some other kind of communist nods in these panels, in various panels. Mm -hmm. In one of them, there's a, like a newsstand scene, and they include radical newspapers at the time, like the New Masses and the Daily Worker. Cool. Yeah, yeah. At one point, they show a labor march. There are these three panels. I could not find them, which I will explain why in a second. There were these three frescoes. They're kind of smaller. And mm -hmm. one of them symbolized capitalism and had like, I can't remember what exactly they had on it, but something to give that effect. One yeah. symbolizing the New Deal and one straight up symbolizing communism, including a hammer and sickle and the quote, workers of the world unite. Oh, damn. <laughs> so they what destroyed that or? Yeah, that did not get through. <laughs> <laughs> oh, so he like designed it, but they were like, no, you can't put yeah, this on. Yeah, they had nobody. painted it. So they painted that. Mm -hmm. And then another one was there was a banner above this like crowd of unemployed men. And it was for the Western Worker, which was another like radical periodical. Mm -hmm. So the public freaked out and the <laughs> official opening was canceled. <laughs> oh, goodness. <laughs> and the press wrote like really, they, they also kind of exaggerated like, communism in the tower and like they're making it seem like it was a very prominent feature when it was like pretty small <laughs> yeah so yeah eventually they negotiated to get the hammer and sickle and then that red banner removed but like they still have fucking Karl Marx's book in there so like I don't know yeah. if they just didn't catch that or what <laughs> <laughs> maybe it's like um how they said you know you used to get by the Hollywood code or the, mm -hmm. the comics code by including something ridiculous <laughs> <laughs> and then every, everything else, you know, could go through. Yeah, that's true. That's that's a good point. <laughs> and even like in the library scene, I think it's in this one. Some of the books, they would just write their own names as authors. Like they just did some trolling, which is pretty good. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Who is this guy again? This is cool. Um, Bernard Zakim is the guy we're looking at here, this particular panel. But there's a big list of people who worked on it. It's like 10 people or something. Oh, OK. Yeah. A collab. It was. Awesome. That's the thing about mural work, which is why Rivera had so many assistants that apparently he did not mm. treat well. There's a lot of prep work for fresco involved. Okay, yeah. It's a whole process that I don't, I'm not familiar with. Um, so there's that. And then usually, I think Rivera did a, all of that, the actual painting himself, but usually you have lots of assistants helping you. Yeah. Next, we have William Groper. William Groper. Well, I think this is like on the Wikipedia page, maybe, or something for the New Deal. It might be, yeah. I've seen this before. This looks cool. Yeah, yeah. What do we got going on here? Just checking. Uh, yeah, we got men at work. Mm-hmm. Yeah, all men at work constructing a dam. Okay, all right. I, did, I had no idea. I was going <laughs> to guess a ship, maybe, based on the curve thing yeah, happening over yeah. here. Yeah, that part does look like a all ship. All right, building a dam. Yeah. So this was done in 1938, and I think what this image in particular is a study for the mural, um, but it's for the Department of Interior in Washington. Mm -hmm. And yeah, so this is showing really that glorification of work. You have these very masculine figures doing like really tough guy physical labor. Yeah, like some of them are more jacked than others, but they're all pretty much, they're, they're all brawny. Oh yeah, for sure. I was listening to an art lecture on this piece and they're talking about how it kind of really shows the unity of these workers because they're working in some like dangerous conditions, you know, mm -hmm. it's very backbreaking work, but they're all like working towards one goal. Yeah, and they're all doing like a little different of a thing or helping someone do a thing. Like there's, this is a monumental task that they're they're really taking, you know, parts of mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and uh producing something bigger i don't know if the guy really needs to be up on the on the crane hook there i don't know what he's accomplishing but maybe it's just his turn like it's like you get to take turns riding the crane <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> this is probably the most subtle nod to communism we're going to get here but this painter was a communist and in this painting he put a red handkerchief in the back pocket of one of the workers uh the guy in the top right not like that hardcore, I guess, in the move. <laughs> <laughs> he was really worried about getting called out. Yeah, he was he was careful. He did not put a fucking copy of Karl Marx in it. <laughs> just one of the workers on break. Just That one guy's holding a hammer, you know. Oh yeah, yeah, that too. But but also uh, he's just also working, so <laughs> he could just need a hammer. Yeah. <laughs> this guy was actually a communist though. Oh, cool. He grew up super poor as like a Jewish immigrant. 
his mother worked in sweatshops and he even like kind of worked for them like doing like deliveries as a boy Mm -hmm. he lost a favorite aunt in the triangle shirtwaist factory fire oh wow yeah he worked for super left-wing publications okay i'm gonna read you a list of these publications you're gonna tell me what's your favorite name it's gonna be hard okay (laughs) (laughs) the revolutionary age good the liberator good the new masses good the worker that's pretty good a little more tame the rebel worker that's better than the worker yeah Yeah. um that one's actually uh the iww's magazine oh all right yeah nice so yeah he works for some cool publications he was also a cartoonist (laughs) so i love that (laughs) that was cool he illustrated sweatshops strikes the just the effects of the great depression he would do caricatures of like senators and cops and capitalists in general (laughs) hell yeah it's more of that social realism sort of thing exactly yeah um so much so that the fbi started a file on him 1941 welcome to the club (laughs) <laughs> yeah, I mean, if you're saying you're a communist and writing for the new the uh, new masses, then yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you're definitely on the list. And he was, in fact, interrogated by the HUAC committee. Oh. House on American Committee. Mm-hmm. This is crazy. He did, like, an illustrated map of America. I think, from what I remember, it was, like, kind of a folksy, like, here's where Johnny Appleseed was and shit like that. Yeah. <laughs> they accused him of hiding, like, secrets in it for the soviets in an in in like a uh, an illustrated map yes <laughs> what secrets could he have possibly i don't know, I don't like, know. They, they have access to <laughs> they can just <laughs> they get can just maps. look at a map <laughs> yeah that's hilarious yeah so yeah he was questioned heavily just in general by them obviously and mm-hmm. he actually made a ton of work about it afterwards um just really fucking skewering the whole process and just capitalism in general. So that's a cool series. The series is called Caprichos. Awesome. Um, That was later. That was like in the fifties or something. So if there's making fun of HUAC and capitalists, so I'm, I'm in favor. Yeah. There's really cool ones. What do you see going on in this next one? Oh, I see some dour capitalists. (laughs) They are mm, all stuffy and, Mm -hmm. They've got their fancy top hat. So they've also got this professor guy in the middle. Mm-hmm. Kind of, uh, he forgot to bring his flower. <laughs> oh, sorry, guys. He looks sad, too. Um, older. There's a guy trapped in <laughs> trapped in the room or something back there. In the, oh, maybe that's just a picture of something. I like that he's trapped, though. He's, like, against the window with his hands. Yeah. Let me out. Yeah, let me out, guys. <laughs> like a cat. That's what I thought at first, but I think that's maybe a picture. I think it is, yes. Uh, and some dead dudes here. Mm-hmm. Uh, some dead people in caskets. All right. This is by Ben Sean, and this is called The Passion of Sacco and Vanzetti. Oh, damn. Yeah. All right. Do you want to tell us what that story was about? So, yeah. Uh, Sacco and Vanzetti, these were Italian immigrants to the United States. They were accused of murdering two people during an armed robbery uh, in 1920. Mm-hmm. Uh, and then they had this, like, rigged trial, basically. Yeah. It's pretty much like... Almost you know, most historians say like this was they didn't do it <laughs> like this. Does, there's no evidence and it doesn't look like they did it, but they, uh, you know, riled up the jury and did a whole bunch of kind of bigoted, you know, anti-immigrant things in the trial. And the judge was just like openly. These guys are anarchists. Mm-hmm. Fuck them. You know, I'm going to put them in jail. And yeah, they they executed them jesus yeah i was reading about it and like the fingerprints didn't match the ballistic report didn't match they coerced Mm -hmm. witnesses two men later like confessed to it and then they still didn't like follow up on that like (laughs) yeah no they 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 rigged the thing from the start and like like i said the judge uh like openly said to one of his friends after the trial you know did you see what i did with those anarchistic bastards the other day I guess that will hold them for a while. Jesus. You know, like, he was just, like, happy that he did that. And everybody could see that it was a travesty of justice. But that's what happened. Yeah. Ben Sean was super interested in this. He, in fact, made 23 different works about this trial. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. It was it was famous, man. It was, like... It was, like, I mean, international. It was one of those, yeah, it was one of those early, like, 
not celebrity trials, but like major trials, mm -hmm. you know, that everybody's the on century. the edge of their seat for. Yeah. Yeah. He was super interested in this as a subject. He had kind of a, a leftist upbringing. So he was born in uh, Lithuania. Mm -hmm. His father was exiled to Siberia for being a suspected revolutionary. Cool. And apparently, as a child, Ben Sean would shout, down with the czar, to anyone wearing a uniform. <laughs> oh, hell yeah. I can only hope to raise such a cool child. <laughs> <laughs> like, should I tell him to stop? That's kind of dangerous, but no, I guess not. It's cool. <laughs> back to this painting, though. Take a look at the guy in the back that you, were, you thought was trapped. <laughs> mm -hmm. So that is a painting. All right. And that is actually the trial judge, the original judge. Oh, the asshole from Webster Thayer is mm -hmm. who that is. The judge himself. Okay. So he's holding up his hand. Take a look at what's on his left. What does that look like? It looks like a very fancy light pole. <laughs> it does kind of. <laughs> what is that supposed to be? It is very reminiscent of a bundle of sticks, which is a classic symbol for fascism. Yeah, yeah, a fascist or whatever it's called. Yeah, there's a word for it in Latin. I don't fucking know. They have them still like above the oh, Senate yeah. and stuff like that. Like it's all over the place. Yeah, it's like on money and shit. Like it's everywhere. Yeah. <laughs> um. So yeah, he's like literally swearing loyalty to fascism. Mm. Pretty cool. <laughs> Got him. The other men in this painting are the president of MIT, Harvard, and a retired judge. They were all involved in the uh, appeal process and all denied the appeal and upheld the execution. Ooh, so he's saying like these guys all played a role mm -hmm. in this happening. Yeah, he's like forcing them to bear witness to what they've done. They look pissed about it too. Yeah, and they, they look <laughs> like kind of unemotional or like they don't, they're not actually grieving for these men. Like they're kind of half-heartedly offering these like dinky flowers. Just like, here you go. Oh yeah. They're like, I'm here. The, the one dude didn't even bring it. That guy didn't even fucking do the assignment. <laughs> <laughs> and I think Lily's also have a strong connection to like the Christ narrative. So, and also like the painting's fucking called the passion of. So like very clearly yeah. setting these guys up as Christ figures. Yeah. Okay. I can see that. Yeah. Dude, he put these guys on blast. This was absolutely <laughs> like saying blood on their hands, man. Basically, yeah. Look at these men who murdered these men. Like, fuck them. Yep. Yeah. That's probably, that might be my favorite from this series that we're going to look at. I dig it. Next, we have Alice Neal. She's an interesting character. What do you think is going on in this painting? Well, hopefully, it's not a session of self criticism. Or... <laughs> she, because there's, so there's a woman in the center. She's got her head in her hands. She's weeping, maybe. Mm -hmm. Or just stressed. We've all been there. Yeah, right. She's sitting in a chair at a table, and there's a lot of people around her. Mm -hmm. uh, men and a couple of women. A couple people have paper. This other person's got maybe a pencil or something. Mm -hmm. What would you say the expression of everyone around the lady is? Some of them look worried. Some of them just look kind of interested. Mm-hmm. One, the guy in the foreground here with the hat in his hand <laughs> does not look interested. Yeah, he looks sleepy. <laughs> but, all right, yeah, that's kind of the mix I see is like kind of a concern, almost like a group therapy session, maybe. Yeah, it kind of looks like it. So this piece is titled Investigation of Poverty at the Russell Sage Foundation. Oh, okay. So this was done in 1933. This is showing a woman basically at the mercy of this nonprofit who's basically investigating whether or not she's poor enough to receive aid. Wow. I love this piece. I know I just said the other one was, is my favorite, but I, I love the message behind this so much because, you know, we love to shit on nonprofits here. <laughs> <laughs> and yeah, she basically was like, yeah, that's, that's all they do. They just investigate the poor. They don't give them money. <laughs> right. And they're poking and prodding. And I, I, I yeah, man, that's great. Cause and that really makes it, if you don't know what the context is, you're mm -hmm. like, okay, this is weird, but cool. Um, but to know what these guys are actually after, they are, no one here, uh, they, they look maybe interested. A few of them, I think, do look a little concerned, but nobody's like, hey, are you okay? Or anything like that. Yeah. Very just observing. Dispassionate. Yeah. Dispassionate. Yeah. yeah. She's here clearly in a, you know, one of the 
shittiest times of her life that she's you know in in utter despair and they're all just like witnessing it yeah yeah there's these like impartial witnesses that don't seem to have any empathy yeah several of them like i said just taking notes just like Mm -hmm. interesting check this box check this box yeah that's good yeah right i love this painting (laughs) (laughs) She rejected realism because she was like, that's some capitalist bullshit. You're just trying to replicate a capitalist world. So fuck that. She was much more about an expressive and like humanist style. Like she was all about showing that emotion. Okay. Not showing things exactly how they visually look is what you mean? Yes. Yes. Okay. She did. Yeah. She didn't like that. She also really didn't like abstract art. She thought that was like too far the other way. Like, no, we need to show what's happening. She's. Yeah, she's still kind of doing social realism in the sense of showing the real problems, mm-hmm. but in, you know, each person, like this guy over here is like really <laughs> fading into the background almost, like he's so grayed out, you know? Yeah, definitely like using color and texture to show more evocative portraits of people. Yeah, okay. So she got her start at the WPA, had kind of a rocky relationship with her. This one lecture I was watching was telling a story about how Apparently she painted a scene like at a butcher shop and Mm -hmm. there was like blood everywhere because it's a butcher shop. (laughs) Yeah. And the person she turned it into told her to get rid of the blood. (laughs) (laughs) And so she did so she could get her money. But apparently later she bought it back and put the blood back in. (laughs) (laughs) Well, I imagine it was a big part of the scene, right? Right? Like, how are you going to do a butcher with no blood? (laughs) So, well, I mean, you're trying to encourage people to go out and spend money at the butcher shop. I guess, I guess. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Make it look clean. Yeah, she's just a really interesting character. She goes on to really keep hammering this leftist drum in a way that I find is very interesting. Mm-hmm. At one point, she paints her kid. She paints him like in his early 20s or something. And it's like this very warm and loving portrait. And then later, he becomes a Nixon supporter. <laughs> Oh, whoa. (laughs) And she paints him again and calls it Richard in the era of the corporation. (laughs) Ooh. And, like, you can just see she's putting her son on fucking blast. Like, his skin is kind of greenish. He's in this awkward pose. Like, you can just tell, like, she's disappointed in him. Ouch. Yeah. Just put him on blast. So what were her, like, uh, uh, her, you know, actual, did she have any actual connections with a socialist or communist party or anything yeah she painted lots of people on the party um mother boar is another one she did mm-hmm. she was a activist and she was one of like the top ranking female members of cp usa kenneth fearing was another guy she painted who was like this famous leftist poet mm-hmm. so yeah she was like involved i don't think she was a member of the party at any point she just was kind of like in their circles okay so a fellow traveler. Yeah, she was she was in in the mix. But yeah, that's Alice Neal. Yeah, I dig that. That one's that one may be my favorite mm-hmm, one. That's a good choice. All right, next we got a kind of a creepy one. Hmm. <laughs> what the All fuck right. is happening here? Do you think? There's a lot going on. All right. <laughs> so I'm imagining this from the, a perspective, like uh, mm-hmm. I'm supposed to be, or we're supposed to see this from the point of view of whoever, like. At this the is table. A, per, a point of view, right? Yeah. And like, because there's like a hand and typewriter here. Maybe this is his desk or whatever. It's a fucked up desk. <laughs> uh, you have like a couple of maybe or a few soldier guys over here on the right. Mm-hmm. They look kind of soldiery, but old, maybe veterans. Uh, guy with a funny hat. <laughs> like a fez or something. In the corner, yeah. You got a couple of business consultant people or politician consultant people there. With their ties. Well, you might have some clans. I just now noticed that. <laughs> in the back left there. I think those are clansmen. You have some yeah. like maybe Satan goat here. I like the Satan goat. Points for that. <laughs> and I don't know what the old guy in between the politicians and them is. Just an old man with, I don't know what he's holding. It looks like a pipe maybe. Could be a pipe. Yeah. There's like pigeons everywhere for some reason. Oh, okay. Yeah. I At first I thought those were like. Mm, tubes of paint mm, that yeah, yeah. Are like on the <laughs> yeah those are pigeons i mean it's very uh, fuzzy <laughs> you're right yeah this whole thing's like out of focus all right so this is called feast of pure reason by jack levine this is done in 1937 so at the very tail end of the federal art project 
This looks a lot more, I don't know how to say it, but like more modern than that. Yeah, very abstract. It's it's really getting into like expressionism as a movement, I would say. Abstract mm-hmm. expressionism, I think is the term. So yeah, he was a WPA artist from 1935 to 1940, and his work is all about showing political corruption. Okay. Yeah. I can see it. So yeah, in this you see like police officers and politicians and, and businessmen all conspiring together in this like little cabal. Yeah, and they've got the clans guys, the clansmen back there. I know. Too. I'm so freaked out by that. I'm really I'm scrolling down so I don't have to see them anymore. They're scaring me. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, that was a super common theme in his work. He does a lot of this kind of work and really continues it to a point where most people are like, I thought we were done with that. <laughs> But this is just what he's about. Yeah, he is all on that social realism train, just like fucking skewering politicians and cops and shit, doing these like really, honestly, nasty looking portraits of them. Yeah. Kind of like an unmasking or like, this is what they really are like. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Maybe not directly tied, but I mean, if he's tearing down the cops and tearing down politicians, he's obviously... He's on the right side. In the same lane, (laughs) you know? Yeah. I didn't find anything. I mean, he also got flagged by HUAC, you know, a lot of these good. artists did. <laughs> yes, good. <laughs> That's how you know you're doing something right. We would have been hauled up there back in the oh day. Oh my God, absolutely. <laughs> and I have to fly to Washington every week. Like, I know, I know I said I want to get rid of the government again this week on the podcast. <laughs> Sorry. I was yeah. joking. I'm it was funny. a joke. It's satire. It's satire, actually. You just don't get it. <laughs> <laughs> on to our final work which has quite the backstory. Ooh, all right. All right, what do we got going on here? I like this part where I just ask you to describe pictures to me. Yes, uh, <laughs> it's it's difficult. This is the most challenging part of it. Yeah, I'll go left to right. Sure. So left, we've got a lot of people raising their hands to a guy who is a, a guy in a suit. Mm-hmm. I think he's just pointing to them. I think kind so, of yeah. Holding out his hand. And they're all like laborer looking people Mm -hmm. in the middle. uh, We got the masses. Someone's holding up a unity sign and the the guy in the front's like, you, he's pointing a finger at the, at the boss guy. It's clear Mm -hmm. now this guy's the boss instead of what they show below him. Instead of like a handout, someone's just giving a little hand. Oh, I didn't even see that. Instead he's saying like, no, we're going to, you know, that guy up there is lording over you. We got to fight together and. Then win our, you know, do a strike and it says strike one, it, strike like victorious. Yeah, not strike, <laughs> strike one. one. <laughs> We're going to kill him. <laughs> right. So they win their strike. And then on the right hand side, um, you have older people. They look older, mm-hmm. I think. Maybe that's like the future that they can win. Like this is, um, it's multiracial. Mm-hmm. It's. The whole thing is. Yeah. Yeah. And. It's still like America. It's still like American kind of pride. There's American flag back there, I guess. So it's like, I guess, patriotic in that way. But it also like, I don't know. That's to me, it looks like kind of a patriotic, which is weird, but like like looking forward, pro, like worker thing. Yeah. So this is called History of San Francisco, and this is okay. panel number twenty four. This is a huge piece in general. I think there's twenty seven panels. Damn. All right. And this one is called The Waterfront, and it's by Anton Refriger. I am assuming mm-hmm. that's how you say it. And this was done in 1946. So again, another pretty late piece in this program. Mm-hmm. So this is called History of San Francisco. So he shows a ton of stuff in this, um, which will kind of cover some of the other things he shows that people did not like. But this is the most, probably the most controversial part. I think I know what it's depicting. It is the 1934 West Coast Waterfront Strike. Ah, oh, okay. I was going to say Longshoreman. That is exactly I... what that is. Oh, okay. It's the same one. <laughs> All right. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Basically, you have these longshoremen, so people who work shipping, mm-hmm. um, and their companies all had what's called a blue book union, which is basically just a company union, which is to say okay. not a union. <laughs> right. They sign you up for the union and they tell you what's going to happen. Yeah. Which is crazy. You still pay dues. And I'm like, what the fuck? <laughs> Yep, that's it's insane. slush fun for the boss. Yeah. They had a closed shop. So you had to do that. Mm-hmm. And basically, that was a big source of the conflict, was that the longshoremen wanted an open shop, and the employers refused. And that led to an 83-day strike. 
get their own independent union, do their own thing. Yes. Classic. Some strike breakers showed up, some scabs and some cops, and there were just tons of clashes culminating in what is called Bloody Thursday. Another bloody day on the books. Mm, there we go. Mm -hmm. Our first Thursday. Maybe. First Thursday, as far as I know. The police shot tear gas into a crowd of strikers because they wanted the port open for 4th of July and fights broke out and it ended up with two deaths. What? Even though they were using non-lethal tear gas and <laughs> they shot showing them. such restraint. They shot into the fucking yeah. crowd. There's oh, wow. different accounts. One, you know, the more conservative side's like, no, they were trying to flip over a police car. That's why they did it. And another one was like, no, they just started shooting. <laughs> <laughs> so right. also just execute someone for trying to flip a car yeah also like. not great <laughs> <laughs> so yeah there are two deaths mm -hmm. so the strikers like immediately like cordoned off this area that they were killed and put down like flowers and wreaths and the police fucking removed the flowers like right away like Assholes. what the fuck guys trying to bully him more yeah basically the national guard and the army show up <laughs> oh wow yeah they're not fucking yeah. around they keep trying to negotiate, like Roosevelt's involved trying to figure out like what the fuck can we do about this, but mm -hmm. they cannot come to an agreement. So they decide, you know, I think definitely motivated by these deaths as well. Like we're going to go on a fucking citywide general strike. Hell yeah. General strike. My favorite. Yes. 150,000 workers involved in this. They did like a processional for the victims. Mm-hmm. Everyone fucking stopped working. The city basically closed down. I think really all they had going was like food delivery. They The unions allowed that to keep going, but everything else, yeah. lots of small businesses were closed for it in solidarity. Like it was fucking cool. And that's like the uh, the longshoremen's like independent union, right? Not like the, the old uh, company yeah, one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I believe okay. it was like a few unions working together. It was a very confusing mm -hmm. system. <laughs> I gotta say, it was hard to keep track of, like, who is in charge. Yeah, but, I mean, if they have, like, a council of union people... I like, think that's, that's accurate. You're basically doing anarcho-syndicalism there. 300 people were arrested for being, quote, radicals, subversives, and communists, so... What the fuck? <laughs> just just to I guess roll up and that. arrest someone for that? Yeah. yeah. Well, uh, you know, we've talked about before that this uh, fucked up laws about just being a member of anything. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. So the strike lasted four days, and then they called in the California National Guard, and they literally blocked off a street with a machine gun attached to a truck. Whoa. And they did that so they could protect the San Francisco fucking PD doing a series of raids. Wow. Let me tell you this list of places they raided. It's a lot of places. All right. Starting with the Marine Workers Industrial Union. The okay. Workers Ex Servicemen's Leagues headquarters, Workers mm. Open Forum, uh, the Western Worker Building, which also housed the main offices of the Communist Party, a fucking soup kitchen. Oh wow! Well, well, yeah, because that was that was rubbing it in their face that hey, we can do this without the bosses. We can do this without you, you know, mm -hmm. masters and all that. It was like a union-sponsored soup kitchen, I believe. It's like, yeah, it's like when they would go and bust up the uh, Black Panthers, like, breakfast program. Exactly that. Exactly that. Also, just neighborhoods, just fucking people's houses. So, yeah. Yeah. And that's like when they would go and roll through the, you know, the neighborhoods that they were sure were supporting the IRA and stuff. The British mm, would, yeah. would target them. Yeah. Same shit, different place. Dude, this is the fucking shit cherry on top of the shit Sunday. A police spokesman, quote... Maybe the communists staged the raids themselves for publicity. They just, they burned the, th the, the place down themselves. Like, <laughs> has anything changed? Am, am no. I living in the 1930s? <laughs> Jesus Christ. <laughs> yeah, maybe they did it to themselves. Oh, my God. Classic. Ugh. So, yeah. An oldie and a baddie. Yeah, right. <laughs> oldie and a baddie, yeah. Classic for a reason. It sucks. That's the reason. <laughs> Man, all right. So, I mean, did they mop up, basically? They basically mopped point? up, yeah. The strike ended. The tension did not end, though. There were aftermaths of spontaneous strikes and agitation. Mm -hmm. The eventual result, though, was the unionization of all West Coast ports in the United States. Hell yeah. That's 
as a good. victory. <laughs> I mean, it should not have, yeah, sh- shouldn't have happened so shittily, but yeah, it's good that it did. They got the raise they asked for almost exactly. I think they got like 96 cents instead of the dollar they asked for. And it also inspired more unions to pop up in the area, including the Department Store Workers Union and the Retail Clerks Association. People wonder, you know, why Amazon, why any major corporation, they pour so much money and resources into fighting unionization drives. It's because when they succeed, it spawns more. Yep, absolutely. People say, oh, they did it there. Fuck yeah, let's do it. Yeah. And, you know, and why, why? Because it's good because it gets, they got their race. It's just like why they were always afraid. Oh, we can't let this communist nation, the socialist nation succeed because then more people nearby (laughs) will do it. Why? Because it's so bad. No, because it's it's so good. We can't have nice things basically. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) Also very cool unions. Like a, a department store union, a retail clerks union. That's awesome. Yeah. Yeah. Eventually merge them into one big union. Just general strike. Fuck yeah. There we go. Let's do it. <laughs> Refugé was forced to make some edits. Oh, okay. This wasn't the. This, this is, wasn't what he intended. This is the edited version. <laughs> All right. I like it still. It's but still very what's good. The, what's the parental advisory explicit content <laughs> version? So the leader in the middle was apparently a portrait of Harry Bridges, who is heavily involved in organizing and leading the strike. Um, okay. So he changed him just to be like a guy. Okay. I believe it was one of the men on the right. Um, they used to have a hat from the veterans of foreign wars. Um, so I guess that was controversial to say that like veterans were involved in this like union shit. I'm not super yeah. sure what the controversy was on that TBH. <laughs> Dude, that's, yeah, that's messed up. Like veterans at that time, I mean, so the time period here for the the longshoreman strike, what was that? 1934. 34. Because like you can, there was something called like the bonus army marches. I, yeah, where, I heard like, about Veterans that. were, yeah, they were like marching on the capital demanding that they get, they paid their bonus from fighting in, fighting in World War One, And mm-hmm. they like, you know, turned the troops on them. I mean, it's, I don't know why it would be controversial <laughs> to. Like people knew that happened. Yeah. <laughs> well, that's the thing. So this was supposed to be all about like an idyllic history of California. And we'll see this in the rest of the panels as well. Like they did not like this very realistic history. They're like, oh, this is not what we want to advertise. <laughs> mm, yeah. <laughs> so other controversial panels, he depicted the brutalization of Chinese immigrants. People did not like that. Did they make him throw it out? Nope, still there. <laughs> oh, good. Wonderful. <laughs> People did not like this. Surprise, surprise. They said some panels were, quote, an outrageous attempt to arouse class hatred, a.k.a. my favorite kind of art. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and they're still at that today, still at that sort of censoring of any sort of teaching of history. You know, it's been in the news lately about Texas doing the, oh, you can't teach teach critical race theory or these sorts of things. Yeah. The, good news for listeners is that the way that's worded is it's it doesn't end up amounting to anything Mm -hmm. for teachers like it's not going to affect me really at all (laughs) because they worded it real stupid so yeah you don't really have to worry about but it's just like you know this constant like pushback at this imagined foe that's trying to like you know corrupt your your heroes that you've lionized and whatever yeah like, I mean, they were even doing that then, I guess. Absolutely. Know? Yeah. If you go through the panels, I think they have them all just listed out on Wikipedia with the images. So you can just kind of click through them. Mm-hmm. Yeah. It, it is a really, there's definitely some like lionization of particularly workers like we've seen throughout. Yeah. But there's, yeah, he's showing what happened. He's showing uh, the gold rush. He's showing Native Americans. He's showing like an actually more accurate picture and people do not fucking like that. They don't like to be disturbed. So we have a guest appearance on the pod. Guest. All right. All right. Let's bring him in. Our good friend, uh, Nixon. (laughs) Oh, yeah. That asshole. He was one of the people trying to get this mural removed. Why? What? This is his quote. I'm not going to do the voice. I'm sorry. 
I believe a committee should make a thorough investigation of this type of art in government buildings with the view to obtaining removal of all that is found to be inconsistent with American ideals and principles. Man. What a so, fucking yeah. Karen. Spot on. That's exactly what they're still <laughs> doing today. Like, it's just an old school like te fight over the textbooks, basically, you know? Yeah, yeah. And this dragged out for a long fucking time. They were like congressional hearings about this fucking painting. And it lasted until 1957. That's how long. This was finished in 1946. <laughs> where was this um, put up, by the way? Like, where was it being displayed that they were so upset? The Rincon Center, which is, it looks like a shopping center, basically. Shops, restaurants, offices in downtown San Francisco. And they were just upset that the passerbys would learn the wrong history? I guess so. <laughs> It's like, it doesn't even show, I don't know. To me, this is just not that, like, risque. Like, it it's not you know, that crazy. We're not putting, you know, hanging capitalists <laughs> or guillotining them or... Every mural is just a guillotine. <laughs> All the artists wrote to each other. people punching cops in the face. Like <laughs> The artist union was like, we're, we're doing guillotines, right? That's, that's this month's theme. <laughs> yeah, but I mean, I guess, you know, Nixon can find a can find a communist behind every curtain. Mm -hmm. I, I think also, so these were finished in 1946, so right after World War II. So there's this big patriotism push, the, the obviously. <laughs> yeah, the Red Scare mm -hmm. kicking off again. Exactly. So did he fail? Did he, you know, everyone was just like, fuck you, we're keeping it? Yeah, it's it even got restored in the 80s, like got a touch up. <laughs> oh, good, yeah. good, good. Still around. It's fun to see Nixon fail. I love that. It's one of my favorite things. <laughs> So this brings us to the end of the WPA in general and also the federal arts program. Basically, hey, we got a war on. We got to like stop doing this shit. Actually, a lot of pieces of art were destroyed or sold off. Wow. Okay. Like people would recycle things like to use in plumbing. I'm not exactly sure what parts of paintings are useful for plumbing, but sure. Uh, Canvas? Yeah, no idea. I don't know. Sculptures and stuff were like melted down to use for ships and bullets and shit like that. And yeah, throughout the 50s, HUAC basically spent a ton of time investigating various artists and writers involved in the program for communist sympathies. Hmm, yeah. Lots of murals were actually painted over for various reasons. Some of that, I believe, was involved with HUAC, and then some of it was just like, eh, whatever. Like, <laughs> we're doing this now. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, so there's been a big effort to like restore those and like see if you can kind of peel them back. Yeah. That sucks to imagine how many of them are lost i know yeah weirdly enough though there is a small kind of resurgence of this type of program through the comprehensive employment and training act of 1973 signed by nixon weirdly enough. okay i mean some people claim he was our last liberal president so <laughs> founded the epa i mean yeah you know broken clock i was just gonna say that but i could not think of the idiom i was like a blind clock a a blind, blind mouse. Yeah. I could not think of it. <laughs> but yeah, it was kind of a similar program. Employed like 10,000 artists in, through 1980. Wow. Yeah. Weird, right? It was just, you know, I mean, maybe he put them through like a political <laughs> test first. Yeah, first. I don't want any of those communist bastards in there, you know? <laughs> yeah. You could only paint like flowers and like no flower symbolism shit. No vaginas. Nothing like that. <laughs> yeah. None of that hippie shit. Just flowers. <laughs> so yeah, I, I want to talk a little bit about like the legacy of... WPA yes. and, and yeah. this program in general, some of the things it did for the art world. One, the restrictions were pretty loose, as we have seen. Mm -hmm. It really helped like abstract artists because they did not discriminate by style. Yeah. Is it uh, very fair? Jackson Pollock? Yes. Did he, do, he was involved in this? He was. He got a start through this and like that absolutely helped him financially. And they let him do, like, his style of thing. It wasn't, like, draw horses or something. I'm not sure what his early work looks like. I know at one point he was actually an assistant to one of the regionalists we talked about at the beginning. He actually is in one of his paintings as, like, a model. Oh, okay. So I, I think he had more of a traditional start to his career. So I'm not super mm -hmm. sure. But he, he got to fuck around in this and, like, actually, like, make a living. <laughs> yeah. But in general, you're saying... Like abstract art was. It, it definitely like was bolstered do by this. Yes. Yeah. Cool. It's kind of a mixed bag because like there's the easel program like we talked about. And then there's also like the public works like 
project part of it or like mm-hmm. the treasury had their own department of this too so like those were more like public um so you could like you could lose a commission or not win out on a commission like often they would have contests for murals okay yeah yeah you still had to like abide by a little bit what people wanted but as we saw people really towed that line <laughs> right because you could just make one of the books car marks it's, it's capital it's fine exactly you're gonna see that yeah <laughs> In theory, this was supposed to be a a non-discriminatory program in general. Mm -hmm. You had about 12% representation of women artists, which, not great, but better than usual for that time period. Okay, yeah, that's what I was going to ask, is not by our standards. No, (laughs) considering they're half the population, not great. (laughs) They, traditionally, women are represented pretty well in art school. Like, it's seen as a very feminine thing to do. Um, yeah. This is still true today, by the way. It's basically a fucking coven in there. It's great. Uh, <laughs> they often like had trouble succeeding professionally at that time. So it, mm-hmm. it did help a lot of women artists, though, in general. Yeah. It was also helpful for black people. About 15% of WPA employees were black. Mm-hmm. But this didn't just happen. There were unions that like actually did sit-ins to make sure that more black artists were hired. Oh, hell yeah. They didn't just decide not to be racist. That's <laughs> crazy, right? I thought they would just yeah. change their mind about being racist. <laughs> yeah, especially since this was led by the Democratic Party, which was the solid South at that time. <laughs> exactly. It was still harder for black people to get work, even in this program, especially black women. There was a story about, I think her name is Augusta Savage, who was like a sculptor. And mm-hmm. she was basically the leader of that like Harlem art community art center. And like people did not like that. <laughs> Oh, yeah. 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 This program also helped support an influx of artists who were fleeing Hitler's Germany um, and just Europe in general. Mm -hmm. You know, you had this big, poor immigrant population coming over and they had a way to continue their art. Yeah, that's good. Yeah. And we've talked about how, like, that whole scene was very important to, like, the modern American design culture in general. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I was wondering, we were talking about kind of how this helped artists Mm -hmm. and stuff. Does this help... Uh, at the time, and maybe this effect fades if it existed at all, but did this help like professionalize? I don't know if that's the right word, but like make it to where people consider being an artist, not just like something that a socialite can do or something, (laughs) or not, not something that just like you have to get a patron or like a real job or a real profession. No, that's huge. So like for fucking centuries, art has been a, a patronage kind of thing. And mm-hmm. this was a huge shift in how they were approaching that. They're saying, no, we don't, we don't, we're taking out that middleman. It is just art for the people. And yeah. I think it also really helped establish the American art scene in general and kind of just the modern gallery scene. Like the Whitney was founded during this time period. Mm-hmm. You had this big proliferation of galleries in a way that America hadn't really done, whereas like Europe obviously has this very long tradition of it. So is this real like yeah. creation of that scene? Cool. Which that scene has its problems as well. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I just think it's you know, maybe a stepping stone or like you know an improvement, I guess. Yeah, I mean, to me, this really the fact that they're recognizing art as labor is fucking huge. Like, yeah, that's a lot of people don't do that. <laughs> Mm-hmm. And like, and it comes in like the most ridiculous ways of like, oh, you're an artist. Like you just have fun all day. I'm like, mm. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> to me, it's a throwback to like, you know, what do you want to be when you grow up? Mm-hmm. I'm like an artist. Okay. Like that sounds like it'd be fun, but like, <laughs> what do you actually like, want to do? You should do that for fun. But also what, do, what real job are you going to do? There's that kind of big push, I guess, socially, when we were growing up anyway. For sure, yeah. I mean, even now, yeah. If someone says they're going to be an artist, you're like, okay, yeah, how are you going to make money, though? <laughs> Which is <laughs> a valid question, unfortunately. Yeah. But yeah, this this definitely was about bringing art to everyday people. It was taking it out of like these elite urban centers and, you know, the things like the touring theater groups and musicians, you know, creating these art centers in these kind of rural areas, like... There was some yeah. in like Oklahoma and stuff and both in terms of like, here's everyday art, kind of like we talked about in that one episode about like the art of everyday things, like posters, yeah. you know, mm-hmm. just very clearly utility based art yeah, and things like fine arts, like painting and sculpture and things like mural public art. And I don't know, like if you're, if you've been listening and you're like, okay, well, all this 
this art stuff. I get that they put some communist man, you know, uh, <laughs> messages in it, and that's kind of cool. But like, end of the day, it's just art. It's just like a a, a frill, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, we would yeah, we've talked about it before, I think, but I think we would push back on that and say like it's more important to the human experience, like the whole yeah being a human. It's not just about like making sure you have enough money, making sure you're you know you're fed enough and and housed and clothed, but like you need more to that. Yeah, like it's often, like you said, seen as a luxury good when in a lot of ways, like, I don't know if this is too much and this is just my specific lens, <laughs> but like to me, like the making of art is part of what makes us human. Like no other fucking animal does that. Mm -hmm. <laughs> no other animal yeah. like, I made a thing, please look at it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's it's unique to us. It's I've said it before on here, but like it's it's one of those things where if we did have you know, aliens come take over everything. <laughs> we would still do it. They would probably, yeah, they'd probably like say, these humans are interesting. They like, they sing and they dance. They do sports. They mm -hmm. do art. Like the, <laughs> we have a few things we're kind of <laughs> useful for. Yeah. Like it's about the program really saw it as like an essential part of society and like democracy. Mm -hmm. And I think that's really cool. <laughs> yeah, for sure. Some of this was a little bit of populism. You know, they were... You, there's definitely a trend all over the world at this time to use art to align people to their message, Mexican muralism, everything from mm -hmm. that to like straight up Nazi propaganda. And this stuff yeah. definitely falls in there, you know? It's like how Diego Rivera's mural was showing, you know, science, man. Mm -hmm. It just makes progress. It could be good or it could be bad depending on how you use it, you know? Exactly. Same thing here. Like, yeah, you could make some bad propaganda, but to me, like, most art is propaganda. It's weird if it's not. I guess if you're making, like, a... I don't even know what sure. it would be. <laughs> Abstract. I mean, that's not propaganda. Yeah, maybe. It depends what it's about. I'm... I'm well, true. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know. I'm, I'm not great at interpreting abstract art, but yeah. Yeah. But what's interesting... So, like, you'd think, okay, you know, we're doing this government program for artists. You better only make art that was that's good about the government. And Yeah, pro-government, right? <laughs> yeah. And there's definitely some of that. Like, you had a lot of people who are, like, really grateful for this and, like, really fucking leaned into that. You know, like, you have mm -hmm. some, like, look at this gorgeous American landscape and shit like that. And that's fine. Right. <laughs> I get it. <laughs> but, you know, like we saw, you also had some people towing that line of, like, what is political and what can I push with this message? Mm -hmm. But it also, another important thing was it took away that patronage element to the client, basically. Yeah. Especially in the easel program, it's like fucking make a painting once a month, turn it in. You can paint whatever the fuck you want. Mm -hmm. So a lot of these artists had not been able to explore the themes they wanted to because if you're taking private commissions, you're doing things like portraits, you're doing things like landscapes, like you're doing mm. you're doing pretty art for people's living rooms. <laughs> right. Yeah. Here you get to actually say what you want to say. Yeah. Like some of the art I, I didn't include in here, but was really great was stuff like depicting poor neighborhoods. Like there's there's this one where they're showing like. It was called like washing day or laundry day. And it was like all these women doing like domestic labor, basically. And like, you would never be able to paint that for clients. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Why do they? Yeah. They don't care. They don't want to think about it. Yeah. Yeah. So like it allowed a lot of artists to really explore what they wanted to. Like Alice Neal definitely benefited from that. Like a lot of these people like just got to paint whatever the fuck they wanted instead of just pretty shit, which is awesome. Yeah. I think it was interesting too. it first you know, I guess the first I thought about it of the series was the last one, the Longshoreman Strike depiction. Mm -hmm. But like that uh, idea, you said that you know some of them kind of leaned in and just kind of did like you know go America or inoffensive stuff. Yeah. But like this was kind of a critical portrayal of you know history and how you know these workers were cracked down on brutally. Yeah. But it was wrapped in this like more or less kind of patriotic like this idea that like a patriotism which okay you know as communists we're not favorite. like basically yeah we're <laughs> kind of against that but like for to be more accessible to people you don't have to go to like your friends and your family and stuff and be like <laughs> hey America. you know right like be anti-american that you're probably not going to win them over on the first thing mm -hmm. but like you know wanting what's good for your country like and its people is not just like cheerleading everything that it does but also like asking these questions like even the creepy one where it was uh uh the jack levine yeah yeah you know it's like this it's kind of saying this isn't how it should be 
you know, things should be better than this. And mm -hmm. that's, I don't know, I think that's in a way like looking out for your country too. Yeah, I you know? definitely think criticism can be patriotic. So I think they were kind of broadening that to say, we can question, we can say like, you know, hey, we should change these things. This is what's really going on. We should make that better together. Yeah. The one um, Florence Cowell, how we're all mm -hmm. working together, parts of this, you know, it's proud, but it's not unquestioning, I guess. Yeah, yeah. And like, we saw throughout these pieces and there's several other pieces like there's lots of mining ones where it's just like a tough guy mining for gold or whatever and mm -hmm. it's definitely idealizing and often very masculine portrayals of these workers and very like look how tough and cool we are yeah like the groper one where they're all mm -hmm. brawny and working yeah so it is definitely like there's still some maybe socialist realism in there too, like a little bit idealized, mm, yeah. um, you know, definitely pro worker in that sense, but it has the ability to also do social commentary as well. It's just, it's just yeah. which way you want to go with it, you know? And, and again, like you can find lots of art that's just like, I think there's like one of like skating in central park and you know, didn't, yeah. I wrote notes <laughs> on it because I was watching a lecture about the, like, the whole program, but I was like, Oh, I think I'm going to get rid of this one for the series. We don't really need to talk about that. <laughs> Not a ton of content in that one. <laughs> yeah, yeah. That's all I got. I feel like I learned a ton. Yay! <laughs> uh, you know, I, I guess I knew broadly just like, oh, there was the new deal. There was, you know, they paid artists. But I didn't know any of the details. And I'm not very art history knowledgeable. So this was cool. I didn't know a lot of this stuff either. Like, I remember we talked about doing this episode and you're like, I don't know if this is far left enough for us. And I, at first when I did the initial dive, I was like, I don't know if it is either. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But yeah, I mean, it took some, some digging, but yeah, there's some good shit in here. So I was pleasantly surprised. Okay. What are we doing next week? Uh, next week, we're going to talk about Africa's Che Guevara. Oh, who's that? Uh, this is a man named Thomas Sankara. Okay. And uh, he was the first president of Burkina Faso. And he's pretty awesome. And he's like kind of a Marxist Leninist revolutionary guy. Oh, nice. All right. I'm, I am interested. I know literally nothing as usual, but <laughs> that's okay. I know a little bit. Like, a pretty, I think a pretty good amount, but I have to A, brush up on it and B, get some more. Yeah, yeah. Get to so, work. Get out of here. I, I will. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, in the meantime, you can find us online. We are on Twitter at Teach Communism, Instagram at Teach Me Communism. You can send us an email, teachmecommunism at gmail.com. You can send us suggestions for a future episode, questions yeah. for Q&A, or, I mean, we just answered one you know, earlier in the episode today, mm -hmm. you should definitely leave us a review on Apple Podcasts. It is the best way for people to find the show. And I need yep. your compliments and power. Great for the show. Great for us. Mm -hmm. So, you know, two birds, one stone. Yeah. And it is my birthday this week. So you are legally obligated to do that if you haven't already. That's true. It's the law. Mm hmm. I mean, also fuck the law, but also still, fuck the whatever. law. <laughs> it's it's in the theory. Karl Marx wrote it down at one point. Christine is going to have a birthday in this year. Make sure yeah. to, to review their podcasts. It's good praxis, mm -hmm. shall we say? <laughs> Definitely. Anyway, we have a YouTube channel. If that's your preferred listening method, or if you know someone who likes to listen to podcasts that way, so check that out. Yeah. And then we also have a Patreon for $5 a month. You get access to our notes for each episode, including the backlog. So this week you will get my notes. Mm -hmm. I'm going to add some additional sources like that gallery I mentioned that has all of the uh, American Index of Design in it um, and some really yeah. cool YouTube lectures that I watched, um, some awesome like art talks. So, yeah. Cool. Cool. Uh, great. Great job here with uh, doing all the research and everything you really put together quite the episode it was so much fun like i i always forget how much i'm into art history <laughs> <laughs> well, it was dope like i said I, I learned a ton so awesome hopefully our listeners did too yay uh, you guys can tune in next week for another episode of teach me communism where the class struggle is always in session bye goodbye